Yeah, good afternoon and welcome to day two uh, of the Driving the Human kickoff conference. And I hope you are all well and comfortable uh, behind your screens, wherever you are. I greet you from Gray Berlin. Uh, my name is Ariana Dongos and I'm very delighted to moderate this panel on technology. I'm a media scholar, PhD researcher and journalist um, and also work at the HFG Karlsruhe at the University of Arts and Design um, in the theory department. And together with uh, Professor Pasquinelli, I coordinate the research group, uh, KIM, on critical studies in AI. It is also uh, situated here at the HFG. And in our projects, we politicize AI, artificial intelligence, by addressing emerging new potentialities and complex um, reality, uh, reality. So we want to criticize uh, techno euphoria around AI, but also assess its potentialities, for instance, for digital activism. So we want to dismantle the notion of technology as neutral, a hence uh, for the good per se, um, by showing its limits, its fallacies, its biases, but also this allows us then in a second step uh, to imagine and design alternative uses because of course technology uh, should benefit um, the whole of society and not just a particular class uh, or certain groups. And I think these two aspects, first a proper analysis, a criticism, and then uh, the imagination of an alternative um, um, a solidaric other future uh, will be uh, roughly mirrored in the structure of this panel today. And we will address pressing issues, we believe, related to the widespread deployment of AI uh, systems, its implications for culture and societies. And we start our discussion and focusing on the limits and fallacies of AI systems and something that we could maybe uh, name image politics or politics of AI training data sets. If you participated already in this conference, you will know this already. If not, please let me quickly walk you through the structure of this panel. So we start the discussion with a quite short introduction um, by the panelists themselves in which they address important points and arguments um, that we uh, will refer to later in the discussion. And please feel free to comment and ask questions in the Q&A session after the panel. And if you have questions, or want to leave a comment right now <laughs> during the panel itself. We also have a Telegram chat uh, open to your contribution um, that was communicated or is communicated with you widely, I guess. And dear Maximilian, <laughs> dear Max, maybe this is a good starting point now to hear about your work expertise. Let me quickly introduce uh, Max to you. He's a PhD candidate at the Amsterdam Machine Learning Lab and he is developing novel AI algorithms primarily for computer vision applications, like for instance, image classification and segmentation. He will explain what that means to you. Yeah, and I'm happy to welcome you and please give us a short statement about your angle on the topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks to Ariana for this introduction. Um, I maybe will go uh, shortly over what I do on a daily basis. So like I'm a PhD student uh, in my last year and my PhD topic is really developing of AI algorithms. And what that usually means is I have to choose two things. I have to choose a number of parameters and how these parameters are connected in an AI model. And the second part is usually I have to choose a training algorithm that then will adjust these parameters in the, in the model. And like a simple example is always like classifying do dogs and cats, like images of dogs and cats. And so for each um, of these two classes, I have to give to the AI model a lot of training examples, which means an image of like a cat or a dog, and then a label that tells the algorithm, uh, the AI model, there is a dog or a cat in the picture. And it is very important to stress here that I don't tell the AI model what to look for. Like I don't tell like, look for noses, noses and ears to distinguish between uh, cats and dogs. I, uh, just give it the data and needs to figure out all of that uh, by by itself, like the model by itself. And to do that reliably, it needs a lot of data. And one thing I kind of become concerned about now, especially in the late stage of my PhD, is um, these models will use everything they can find in these pictures. And that leads to a lot of problems. And since the data sets become bigger and bigger, it becomes harder to tell what is actually in these data sets and what is actually the AI model using to um, do its task. 
And in addition, maybe as a last note is a lot of time, I also don't know really where each item in the data set comes from. And so I think these are uh, rather concerning questions that are usually not asked in the field that I am in, where people really strive for novel novelty and uh, performance. Yeah, thanks so much, Max. Um, I think we will get back to this uh, right away. But for now, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Simone Niki. She's a designer and researcher based in Amsterdam, and she teaches design research at Art Ets. It's, it's a University of the Arts uh, in Arnhem, and is uh, Chief Information Officer at the Design Academy Eindhoven. So at least I can pronounce the, the Dutch names correctly. Dear Simone, please also quickly introduce yourself and your work. Yes, thank you, Ariana, for this introduction. Um, and thanks for having me virtually here, You're even though welcome. we're in the same physical place, more or less, Max. Um, so I mean, I'll just sort of, I think, hook on to um, the questions that Max ended with. Um, I mean, I'm a designer researcher with um, a studio called Techno Flesh, and what that means is mainly that I'm concerned um, with questions around computer vision, so around representation, um, a lot of my work sort of begun with um, looking into how a body is digitized and that sort of led to looking into the histories of 3D scanning, photogrammetry, um, sort of different modes of capturing that, that sort of uh, surpass um, photography as a wet lab. And through that sort of um, research into, for example, facial recognition, um, something I was doing a while ago, it really sort of led me into asking, hey, but facial recognition, sure, it kind of makes sense to the human mind what that means to recognize a face. Um, but how is something like that translated to, to computer vision or machine vision, um, where you sort of outsource it to a different intelligence, I think on this panel, we sort of refer to it as an artificial intelligence. Um, so how does vision, something that is pretty banal and taken for granted, even though it's not even for a human, um, how is that being translated to other than human? And with that, I think come questions that to me are super fascinating and from what I hear uh, from Max as well. And uh, I think part of what is so fascinating about them is again, that they're taken for granted often when it's something that you can just simply do. Um, so for example, the cat and dog example is something, yeah, well, sure, I know what a cat and a dog is, um, but having to actually translate it and explain this um, either to, to another sort of species or to a machine um, comes with a lot of sort of design questions, I believe, um, that are really interesting and also have, have consequences on society at large. Um, and this is where the data set comes in. And I think that's something that we're going to talk about a little bit more. We will, but let me first um, go back to uh, Max's research because we really have the, a rare opportunity to have a programmer, researcher, scientist with us who's really working on the fundamentals of object detection. And in our first meeting, you were saying uh, a lot of the algorithms you develop are so-called multi-purpose algorithms. Uh, that means that you can have one algorithm, but the, 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 the deployment, the possibilities are uh, multiple, obviously. So I would be interested in um, how do you know what kind of algorithm, the, the algorithms that you develop, in, in what areas will they be deployed, for one? And then also you had this uh, notion of questionable research that, were, that I really like, that I would like to get back to, because how can you um, make sure that you only detect a cat or a mouse or a dog or a face? How can you um, not, um, how to say, like you said something, there is a tendency, or correct me if I'm wrong, to detect anything in an image. So this will of like to, to really absorb as much information as possible. And again, if this comes into maybe a questionable research situation, so it could be used for the good, obviously, but then again, um, where, the, where do the, uh, the, the, the algorithms, the models uh, end up that, that you develop, maybe with a different attention, um, but just uh, that would be interesting, I guess. Yeah, I think like a good example is like what we call image segmentation. So basically, instead of just saying there's an object in the image somewhere, it's really saying like, where is the outline? And there you could think of like, I think the most common applications are like really medical imaging, where you say like, oh, can I find a nodule? Can I find tumor, uh, tumor tissue inside of an image? And basically the same algorithm, or like it's the same model is used for also detecting pedestrians in a street 
scenery. And of course, you have to change the data that you feed into the algorithm, but the algorithm stays the same. So basically there, then there is this interesting, uh, like yeah, detachment between the data that goes into the algorithm and the algorithm itself. But like, yeah, that's basically what I would call kind of multi-purpose. So, uh, if it can uh, be used for detection, then it really depends on what you put into it. Like what kind of data are you using? And the second thing, what I was referring to also like these kind of questionable things. And also I think what Simone already said is like, we have this idea how vision works, but this is not what uh, the algorithm necessarily has to do. Like I think a really good example is when you have uh, big data sets and there are things related to winter sports. It's a pr pretty silly example, but I think it shows really well what is wrong with these algorithms is um, let's say you want to classify skiing and that's the only thing that has to do with winter in your whole data set. It will not learn what a ski looks like. It will just learn that the image is white, that there is snow because probably a lot of other classes are not related to snow. Like a lot of the other tasks in the data set are not related to snow. So like there are these things that I think people start now to call shortcuts that are very uh, dangerous if because you can't control for them because the model will use whatever it can use to make it life as easy as possible. So it would be a bit like a Pandora's box once it's open, when, once it's um, open to the public um, because it's scientific research, other people could just download the algorithm or the model and fill it with uh, data according to, to their ends, right? Or, so to interrupt you, even worse, um, not even fill up with data, but just use it in another context and say, yeah. oh, it's a related context, that, that will be fine. Mm -hmm. um, you just don't know if it will be fine. And there's also like no way to tell until it goes horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah, maybe also this uh, refer or, or like another point of uh, discussion that we had during our first um, meeting was this very important question then, who's responsible, who feels accountable and where does the bias sit? Because like if, if the one fraction says, but it's in the data, it's in the images, it's in the politics of the images, but the others say, but it's already the, the, the infrastructure, the model. So, so how, how, how do you, like, what do you make out as the current tendencies between this tension? On my side of the field, everybody tries to avoid this discussion. Like if you don't have to uh, talk about the data or like where the data comes from, then you won't do that. So you say, oh, I developed an algorithm that works. I showed in my research that it works. It's nice. I have something novel, but please don't ask me about these questions of like, where does my data come from? Uh, what else? Um, maybe what could my algorithm do? Um, sorry. Uh, where could my algorithm be used? Where it does harm to people? Like all of this is not addressed at all. So maybe to also both of you, the criticism on AI is then mainly coming from a very different bubble, right? I mean, it's not, or do, do you see any, any initiatives that it's being generated from within the, the, the scientific community that, that, that works and builds with these models? I mean, uh, just just if you if you if you know, because I would be interest, interested. I mean, I don't I don't know. I would be happy to hear from Max. I yeah. think on that, because I mean, in general, that's sort of part of what I'm trying to achieve, at least. And it always feels like sort of an outsider trying to yell, even though, at least from from my perspective, what I want to do is not necessarily criticize. I think that's that's sort of the default that happens that you sort of take something you try to analyze it in my case, this is um, data sets and trying to figure out where the data comes from, who created it and what it's used for. Um, and also really show that there is such a thing as a data set and, and make that content visible. Cause I think that's something that at least we're now on this panel table for granted, but it's still, I think whenever the word algorithm is used, it's it's a little bit of a, of a uncertain term to um, a wide audience still. Um, so I think for me, it's more like rather than, than operating in different bubbles, it will be interesting to, you know, generate and work on this sort of questions of AI, ML, um, I think in a much more interdisciplinary manner. So it doesn't end up being someone is creating something and then someone else is critiquing it, um, but that it's much more a form of creation that um, includes different pedagogies. So, you know, philosophy. Um, whatever sort of I think 
create a space to ask bigger questions at the moment of creation rather than whenever something is done. And I think what um, Max sort of put so aptly when something goes wrong, right? Because I'm also always interested in, yeah, but sure, but like, what does it mean that something goes wrong? I think whenever, like when we say it is right now in this moment, it's sort of, I think all of us sort of have an image in mind of what that might mean, right? Sort of um, a facial recognition that only recognizes certain skin colors, things like that. But like, is that really something that goes wrong? Certainly we can agree, but I think there's so many other levels of algorithms going wrong or performing, misperforming, performing in ways that maybe they weren't designed for performing in ways that they do harm, but maybe in a much softer and a much more subtle way. Um, and I think only sort of identifying moments of critique once that has happened, um, to me at least doesn't really seem a productive way to go forward if the word productive even makes sense here. And it would be so much more, um, for one, exciting, I think purely because all of this technology is incredibly exciting. Like I couldn't sit here and sort of say, I'm not like really into it, right? It's like, that's why I'm also working on it. So you're not sort of just someone that's sort of like rant, all of this new stuff sucks, not at all. It's sort of the opposite, right? You, it's coming from a place of passion because of that um, sort of driving it forward in a different way, I think is incredibly exciting. But I mean, yeah, sort of giving it to Max, I'm curious if you know of, of a, examples of maybe interdisciplinarity or these questions being asked at a different moment of creation um, within the scientific field specifically. Um, yeah, so there is a community that addresses all of these questions. They um, have their own conference and usually it's called FACT. So it's Fairness, Accountability, Confidentiality and Transparency in AI. Um, what I find really sad about that a trend that I see now happening is that people working in this very, very important part of AI get pushed into their own bubble. So basically people, like, not like me, but basically people that do, do work like me um, try to also, I feel like, push it away from themselves and say like, there are other people and they take care of that. So I don't have to take care of that. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very concerning trend that I see and also um, uh, as a side fact, I see that a lot of people working in the fact communities are actually uh, women, or let's say not not men. Whereas, like the AI, uh, like people that develop these algorithms, like the AI algorithms, are mainly uh, men. So I think there's also a very weird uh, division of the field happening. Yeah, it's a bit of the classic uh, gender uh, division between the humanities and the so-called hard sciences. Um, but Simon, I would like to get back to some visual aesthetics uh, strategies and maybe talk a bit about your work because uh, I guess for our audience, I mean, um, it's a, like it's always good to have an example to make it a bit more um, tangible what we talk about. I mean, this is also a big, let's be honest, a big problem in how to make criticism understandable, approachable for people who have not been dealing um, with uh, these topics, like maybe us for a couple of years now. So you did a recent work that's called Homeschool. And maybe you want to briefly um, outline what you did there, because I think it's a very beautiful example of how to make certain things uncanny that are actually uncanny in itself. But the way you do it, you, you really make this visible. And I think um, that's a very important contribution to AI criticism. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, homeschool, sort of most of my work is film and writing and homeschool is a 3D animation um, that uses a synthetic. So a, um, in this case, a 3D model. So they're literally three models in this data set of um, items that you would have in a home. I think that already contains a question. What is a home and what are items in a home um, and floor plans? And the reason for this data set is that you could train sort of future uh, domestic robots um, how to navigate a home or how to operate within it. So how to recognize an object that um, they're supposed to interact with um, or how to, you know, clean. And while cleaning, know that, I mean, this would already be super complicated, but like how to clean up, right? Like this is trash um, or this is something to keep, things like this. Um, and with homeschool itself, so the, so the film itself is really um, sort of built these uh, virtual sonographies in um, Blender 3D software, and then move through it with a voiceover from a uh, sort of from a first person perspective. And it's sort of unclear who that is um, from the height of the perspective. It could be a child, but it could be a robot-ish kind of thing. Um, 
and it's sort of trying to understand and learn about its environment. Um, and I mean, the, the film is also sort of, besides actually using the data sets, which normally isn't used for this sort of purpose, sort of really put uh, front and center, um, I was really inspired by it, by sort of a few uh, bits and pieces that I realized in the, while reading the research papers of this data set called CNET uh, RGBD. And there, it was normally moments when the researchers were sort of annoyed, like, hey, it didn't perform correctly. And one was, for example, that um, they were generating these rooms, so these indoor scenes, and a lot of the objects um, that were placed in these indoor scenes were mailboxes. And they were really sort of upset, like, hey, this isn't realistic, right? No one has mailboxes indoors. Um, sort of going down the stack of what they were doing, they realized, well, basically um, it was a really analog mistake or mistake, right? where like mailboxes were deemed boxes uh, put in the folder box. Um, while writing um, the generative algorithm to create these rooms, um, it was sort of logical to think, yeah, sure, um, in um, sort of indoor spaces, you can have a box, like a box to collect things. Um, and so what happened, of course, is that then these objects then were also placed indoors, so these mailboxes. So it's something that seems sort of already the term realistic, right? Like, hey, this isn't how we live. We don't have mailboxes inside. And how that actually then is reflected in an algorithm, um, which was a really simple, um, I think, realization of like, yeah, sure, boxes inside. Let's just um, place them there. But the image it generates is completely absurd and, and beautiful. Um, but I think it really shows the mechanisms of, of how these sort of rooms are being built and how simple it actually is. Um, you can really put it in words, right? It, it's technical, but it's also something that you can sort of spell out in language. Um, and another one was sort of talking to one of the researchers on the team. He was like, yeah, we sort of overtrained the algorithms on toilets because we had way too many files on toilets. And suddenly all um, our algorithm saw is toilets. So like the whole world of this algorithm was a toilet. If it was looking at an apple for human eyes or if it was looking at a bed, it didn't really matter. It was just a sort of a whole world of toilets. And I think that was another sort of beautiful moment where it's just because there was an overload of one kind of data, which as humans, we call toilet, um, right? Sort of the, the output again was also sort of based on language in that way because it was just calling it toilet if it would have been called something else like white sitting object, then that's what it would have been. Um, so for me, again, it was also wondering about this question of language and wondering about like, when is something a toilet and when is it a chair, which I think also culturally is already an interesting question. Like, do we sit on chairs or do we sit on floors and pillows? Yeah. So just, I think to sort of give a short insight, that's a little bit um, where homeschool comes from and um, yeah, what it ended up being, I think sort of a, not a philosophical piece, it is a child walking through, but it, the analogy between a child trying to understand its space um, and computer vision in one way, I think, was a useful metaphor, even though I think in the scientific field, it's not at all like trying to make it a human language. What's going on in an AI is also um, can be troubling for its own purposes, for the, but for the purpose of trying to, to communicate how these technologies work to a broader audience, um, that was sort of the strategy I, I used there. Yeah, thanks, Simone. I think this is a very striking uh, example. Max, do you want to add anything uh, to that? Yes, uh, <laughs> I guess so. It's, no, it's per it's a perfect because like uh, what Simone touched on, uh, like like why do we call that a toilet and who decided that this image or this object is a toilet? And I think that brings us to an interesting question: Who right now is annotating, like labeling these large data sets? And this is mainly done with Amazon Turk like a website a web service from amazon where you can say i have these categories i have these images and i need somebody to look at these images and press one of the categories and there's some research about from a nice uh, very um <laughs> great researcher shakir mohammed and colleagues um they looked into how th these things are even related to uh, decolonization or like um, basically yes how how you can basically trace back um, who is labeling our data, like who's labeling the data for the West. Um, yeah. And I think that's very, very interesting. And also then uh, you, first of all, of course, you don't know who's doing that, right? You go to a service, you say, I need this much uh, labels for this much uh, data uh, points. And then you get it back after a week and you pay some money. But um, also, I think this is a very questionable procedure because yeah. there are... Um, 
um, there are information or like more and more information get available who are these people where are they located and maybe that also is in some cases exploitation and uh, so i think this is another uh, dimension of where our data sets come from uh, yeah absolutely i can i can only underline that heavily because it's part of my phd research where i look at invisibilized labor behind ai and it's um yeah, it's really striking how much of this tedious labeling uh, works. Sometimes it takes up to seven uh, hours to annotate an image correctly, for instance, for autonomous uh, driving, because you have to annotate really everything. Very precise uh, work needs to be done. And this is uh, being outsourced to Global South, more specifically African workers who, of course, work for a fraction of the money, uh, who are very happy that they actually have a job because the economy is in these territories where the outsourcing companies go uh, even lower. And um, yeah, it's a very uh, like, a, like a new yeah, gig economy, micro work in this image labeling industries. And I'm really happy that you're mentioning this because this is another layer of how we could think of politicizing image and training data set, not only what is in the training set itself, for instance, this ImageNet, one of the most famous face recognition data set that has been recently investigated, maybe you heard about this uh, by Trevor Payton and Kate Crawford, who go down step by step the classification biases and apparently a young woman in a bikini then becomes a slutty woman, a young man uh, drinking beer becomes all of a sudden an alcoholic. So you have these this is the way these images are annotated. And this is this one aspect. I think we beautifully um, covered this today. And the other one, um, as a bit also dives into the economy panel, maybe uh, the interlinking between technology and economy that you really have to understand how many millions of images you need to assemble data. And this work of structuring unstructured data cannot be done by an AI. It has to be done by people. Sorry for my... <laughs> No, that's that's strong comment, but I think I'm, I'm super happy that uh, you brought yeah. this up. Yeah, I mean, I think at the same time, I was also really struck by um, the CNET data set because it's 3D data. And I mean, on the one hand, I'm just simply, again, from an from a artistic standpoint, I'm fascinated by 3D software and the history of it, sort of the Western paradigms of perspective, for example, that are embedded within 3D software. But at the same time, I was like, why is this suddenly used um, for computer vision? Because it's already hard enough to find an ample amount of uh, 2D images. So trying to find enough sort of 3D data seems even harder. And it sort of goes back to, to what Max was saying and you, and you too now, which is right, like the, you, you can, um, you don't bypass, but, but you have a different um, labeling process because you don't actually label the final images, but you label the objects and then you generate images from that. So you, um, so how you would sort of imagine it is that you then place these objects um, in a scene, you sort of automatically have a camera, virtual camera going through these scenes, creating a movie. Uh, a movie essentially is a bunch of frames, a bunch of still images. Um, and those still images ultimately become the data sets. It isn't the 3D objects or the videos that are generated, but those frames don't have to be labeled anymore because the 3D data was already labeled. And so quote unquote, it's already known what's in the image. And so even though um, right, labeling sort of generates this, this huge economy, um, even that already is in a danger of precarity because it's sped up through um, yes. yet another sort of way of, of creating this data. So it's already hugely problematic on its own. And now yet again, um, I think it's, it's made more productive and more effective by using a different kind of yeah. data. So also there, I think we just always end up in so many stacks, right? That's so difficult to yeah. sort of dig through um, and sort of find the human within it because as you say, there always is, like there always is a, a human element Yes. Um, in terms of creating and, and making and doing the labor, but also in terms of how it's applied um, and who is actually developing um, these technologies. Yeah. I think, uh, Simone and Max, that was a very nice concluding. I just look at our time. Uh, I think we are about to, oh, no, Bama <laughs> says, you can go on, perfect. So <laughs> we don't conclude, no. Um, Absolutely. So we have like these stacks of information or data sets on data sets. And also, as we've talked about in our um, first meeting, these data sets, they mutate, they morph into new data sets, they travel themselves. So tracking down this evolution is a very valuable and important work. I mean, it's, it's obviously per definitionem 
often when it's in corporate context or in state security context, very difficult, very intransparent. Uh, but I think it's super important not to lose track uh, of that. So we don't fall into this idea of maybe a Nick Bostrom kind of panoptic gaze where we just have one eye that sees all. It's a bit of a sinister surveillance idea, but really to understand the complexities and the entanglements and also the downfalls, the, the limits, and to really criticize this in a, in a, in a very specific uh, way. And I think that's very valuable uh, research. I can just add to that. Um, anything, uh, I'm just thinking because now. No, I mean, I'm just, I think to sort of um, take it from, from what you're saying, I think on the one hand, it's data sets that are recycled. And on the other, it's simply also just data. Um, where I think it's not necessarily the whole cluster that has been assembled um, that could be used for a different purpose. And I mean, I'm just speaking about, um, for example, again, sort of this, this data set of, of body measurements that I, I briefly spoke about in our last conversation, which was um, created around the year 2000, um, simply to be able to, to create uh, masks and cockpit designs for fighter jets. Um, and because of that, um, uh, like a four and a half thousand um, people were, were 3D scanned. Um, and to this day, it's still sort of the, the largest amount of 3D scans um, human bodies that there are, and it's called Caesar. Um, and so there, I think it's, it's not even just a whole data set that is repurposed for different um, bits and pieces, but it's, for example, a bunch of these sort of human scans that are used together with other kinds of 3D data, for example, um, that then is training, I mean, one that I found, for example, is like an image segmentation um, training data set, which has absolutely nothing to do, of course, with uh, sort of ergonomically designing um, fighter jets. And I mean, there I've realized that that sort of having a visual training background is super useful because how I do this research is literally going through uh, research papers and looking um, for what kind of um, data sets are being used and normally um, it's, it's not sort of the file name because the file name changes. So there isn't really a sort of simple uh, command F sort of search find way of trying to identify the data um, and how it's been used over and over. Um, I think Lena is a really good example here, sort of the, the image of um, a woman called Lena who was a Playboy centerfold. Um, one of the first images that was scanned and sort of recycled through the ages um, as an image to train face recognition or any kind of image compression, image analysis, image segmentation. And the same is happening over, I think, Leno we know, and there's so many other ones. And so sort of with Caesar, I was trying to figure out, you know, where does this sort of piece of data end up? And as you do this research, you find so many other ones and they're, I mean, they have their own sort of narratives that are fascinating by themselves. Some of them are really funny, um, but yeah, it's still, I think, What's important to keep in mind is that all of this data has an effect and a consequence in the real world. Um, and that's so laying it bare and communicating about it is, is yeah. I think, incredibly important. But at the same time, I think it's probably also um, sort of trying to go and look for the interdisciplinary work that also Max was, was speaking about yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Max, do you have any concluding words? If not, we can continue uh, in the QA session um, that we could also open open now um yeah maybe the last concluding word um what we didn't touch upon too much right now but i just want to get off my chest is like what i see is also the influence of the companies right like now if we talk about data sets i think and uh, like data sets and research directions like computer vision as a whole research direction I think it's interesting to see how it's driven by the big companies, right? Because um, um, maybe as a silly example, like I can't see the German government using uh, a lot of very fancy tools in the next years, but I can see a lot of big tech companies using them uh, right now. So I think there's this whole idea of um, what are what kind of research questions do we work in? Like, especially myself, what kind of research questions do I get? Um, where's the field heading and who is kind of um, giving us the data and telling us, oh, look, this is an interesting data set. That's an interesting research idea. And I feel right now this is mainly driven by big tech companies. And then they also benefit mainly from that. So maybe that would be- Thank you so much, answer. Max. Yes, absolutely. Okay. This this interlocking between uh, industry and objective, independent scientific research uh, is 
definitely a very important topic. Maybe we, if, if there's a question popping up now from Barbara from the Telegram chat, uh, <laughs> she already said, okay, we will see. But thank you so much um, for bringing this back to the, to the screen, to the conversation, uh, very important. But I would give the word to Barbara, I think. Yes, well, finally, <laughs> not finally, that was a super interesting and lively discussion to follow. Thank you so much, Maximon and Ariana. And uh, I mean, it, it sparked quite some uh, remarks also on Telegram. And we have Mace, who is live jamming with synthesizers and audio effect processors to our voices, apparently, or the soundtrack uh, of this Driving a Human conference. And also the algorithm overtrained with toilets really inspired the collective imagination. So thanks for that. Um, there are like two, uh, three to four questions that I would like to bring into the round. The first one um, has kind of to do with what you were just closing with, Max, with like the, the empowered use of, of AI. Um, and it was a question maybe for both of you. Do we need to consider big data skills yeah. as crucial civic skills for the digital citizen? Or is it just not possible for the wider public or even non-tech researchers to really engage with this kind of technology? Is it too difficult? Don't I know. would have an answer. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, but I also personally really want to hear Max's take. But um, no, I mean, I think mine is more I think it's a question of accountability of what we really briefly spoke about where I'm sort of thinking, you know, just because as a human being, you produce data, if that is on social media or because you're taking a tram um, or whatever you sort of, however you move through the world. I don't think because you generate the data, you also have to be accountable for it um, and the way it's being used. Um, so I think having a certain understanding of, big data would be fantastic, but at the same time, I don't think that would equal or solve questions around how data is being used. Um, I think those are two very different things. Um, similarly to discussions of like, you know, should, do you have to learn how to program? I mean, it's like, yeah, that's fantastic, but that doesn't necessarily make you um, legible in how sort of a, a digital world works. And I also don't think it has to. While I'm sort of receding into the dark, I see. <laughs> <laughs> makes it like a doom scenario no but it's more i think it, it doesn't shift accountability so i think the, the question of accountability remains mm -hmm. um, i totally agree with everything simone said um and then because of that i uh, maybe throw in another uh, angle on this question or like no, another point of view um all of these things we develop are like open source, like mainly, especially when I'm like, I'm working on a public university. So all of this is open source and there's a lot of open source tools. And it's very interesting to see how also there the balance shifts a bit because I will hopefully put it later in the Telegram chat. There are two really cool examples. Like uh, in the US recently, people used facial recognition um, software and developed an app that detects police officers. So really just turning it around, like I don't want to comment on the um, morality of all of this, but basically it's possible, like people uh, can take these algorithms and basically use them uh, also against the government, let's say it like that. And the other example is there's this uh, whole idea of uh, open source intelligence, which I think Bellingcat is for me one of the leading, uh, shall I say companies? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, leading players um, and they use a lot of uh, tools where they uh, harness uh, use data sets and also computer vision algorithms to basically do uh, uh, investigative journalism. So there are positive examples of using all the knowledge that you can find on the internet and use it basically for something uh, that I would call good. Right. I could also give another example, but we can go to the next one. Oh, you can please. Because, yeah, we have our research fellow, Adam Harvey, maybe you've heard about him. I really like his work called Megapixels um, because there he really does this work of tracking down um, how, for, first of all, data sets are being assembled, how are the images uh, gathered. And he found out that in order to have better face recognition, you need so-called data in the wild. That means my face is this, this way, this way, so all kinds of, or even video, yeah? So you don't pose in front of a passport 
um, immigration border uh, agent and you look into the uh, camera and it scans your face, but really like natural wild uh, uh, faces. And the way it has, he showed that very big image training data set that have been used not only by IBM or Microsoft on the private side, but as well by Stanford or Duke University had been assembled uh, through gathering, scraping not only tons of available social media profiles, but as well of uh, surveillance footage camera from a cafe at a corner. Mm -hmm. So really lay laying these questionable, more than gray areas open, he even, and it really did a lot of, um, it gave a lot of repercussions. So as a consequence, um, the companies, but as well as Stanford and Duke universities were forced to take down these data sets and it created a, a big public critical awareness. And I think projects like this, just as your work, Simon, in a different way, once we start to talk about this and really create critical awareness, it can force, because we know the power of the media, yeah? if we can really start um, a conversation. And of course, it does not change the power structure from one second to the other, but I do believe these projects are very, very valuable and that there's many more now being developed. Um, also about the notion about quest questionable research. How are you, how should state institutions be able to cooperate with private corporations? How could private corporations fund state research like public universities all these things are very very important structural uh, topics that we have to discuss much more yeah i think that uh, kind of already tied to just a second uh, a debate that i wanted to take in uh, from telegram where uh, teresa asked why are we okay with the way how ai is being used and then celia uh, responded maybe technological unconsciousness and what i liked about all of your answers were that Maybe we don't need to really know how to program or really understand the, all the details, but we have to be aware of that. And I think all of your work is kind of, uh, and is especially the artistic uh, examples that you that you mentioned, they are promoting um, uh, an, uh, a broader awareness about the problems. And I think that's a good thing to start with. Um, I, I will put another answer into this round, and uh, I think this has to be my last one because time is running and there are so many interesting points to talk to you with. So um, it's a question that says, AI is obviously learning from us. Do you think there will come a point where we will learn from AI, but in a really meaningful way, not a, not a dystopian way? What might that look like? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I would have an example. Um, there's this chess grandmaster. Um, I hope I get the name right, Magnus Carlsen. Mm -hmm. And recently, or let's say, start in the 80s, there were always chess computers and they play basically using rule books. So it's a very big decision algorithm. It's like, oh, if the person does this step, then I do this step. So it's very um, easy also to understand how it works. But recently people, uh, I think at Google, uh, developed a new chess algorithm that works more uh, along these lines of uh, using data and using uh, games that were played and analyzing them. And in the end, you don't know what algorithm does anymore. And this algorithm plays in a very weird way. And so this uh, chess grandmaster Magnus Carlsen started to train with this algorithm. And his next tournament, he just um, beat everybody because apparently the algorithm found ways to play uh, a, such an old game in such a new way that people were very not prepared for that. So that would be the only example I could think of top of my head where this is already taking place. I mean, I think from my own, from my own perspective, um, I mean, I, um, I'm already learning from computer vision at least, not, not AI. I think that's also a distinction that uh, we haven't made. Um, but in this case, computer vision, I mean, already the toilet example, I think it's telling me so much about um, assumptions and human assumptions um, that we're making in sort of training um, or outsourcing vision. Um, and I think that's super useful for me. It's sort of, it's a, it's a check as well of my own assumptions of how the work should operate or what the world should look like. Um, and so I think in that sense, there is already a lot of um, 
useful reflection that can happen within the research of, of AI or, or computer vision. I don't think we need to end up in yet another sphere. I think it's already telling us, so to speak, a lot. All right. Well, thank you both so much um, for your answers. And unfortunately, I will have to um, wrap this up, but there are so many more answers on Telegram. And I um, know that uh, at least Max, you will be joining the Telegram chat, right? To uh, catch up on everything that we couldn't finish discussing, right? And um, uh, I will kind of put my notes in the Telegram chat as well, because that was so interesting with you guys. Um, Ariana, do you want to like wrap this up with one sentence? And before I um, give it to wow. the okay. Um, <laughs> if I if I conclude as a media scholar, maybe we can say wow. Okay, let me think. Maybe to say after it's just recently I, I came across a paper from uh, Simon Schaffer. He's a great historian of science and technology. So, <laughs> and he says um, technology is uh, default, and fault is already inside that default. So we have the, all, all these default normalized notions. But of course, as we talked about, we see uh, the fault level, the limits uh, in it on every uh, level. Maybe that's a, at least a partial conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. That's a really uh, poetic way to end this. So thank you so much, Ariana, Simon, and You're Max. Welcome. See you on Telegram. And uh, yes. for everybody else, we are now going to move on in the truest sense of the word, taking all the insights and inspirations from this panel discussion to our next section about knowledge. We will now have a performance by Vivian Tauchmann, who is inviting all of us to follow her movements and join her in another self as other training. So see you right after that. Thank you very much. <laughs>